Good afternoon and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is uh, Zach Corser. I'm the research director of the Dry Around Table. And I'm happy to be here to introduce you to the final in our spring uh, policy speakers series. Um, a talk today by Norm Ornstein from the American Enterprise Institute. You know, as we float through the Twitterverse <clears throat> looking for our bearings and you look at the media, you look at what people are talking about, you look at the world, uh, it all seems to be very much focused on Donald Trump. But maybe now it's time to start asking ourselves, not focusing so much on Trump, but sort of asking ourselves, what comes next? What are the factors that led to his election? These questions are important. These are questions that we're obviously still asking ourselves, still analyzing. But thinking about ideas for future reform, thinking about ways to respond to the 2016 elections in ways that aren't simply responding to the last tweet. That is the project of, of a new book that's come out, One Nation After Trump, <clears throat> co-authored by uh, Norm Ornstein, uh, Thomas Mann, and E.J. Dion. They look not only at the origin story of Trump in terms of trying to think about how this came to pass, how Trump was nominated and ultimately elected, but they also give a lot of thought to future reform, <clears throat> responding to the problems that are facing America, thinking about, thinking beyond the 2018 election, thinking maybe even beyond the next presidential election. How can we be more constructive in thinking about our institutions of government, uh, thinking about Congress, thinking about elections and the way in which they run, thinking about complicated questions of patriotism and nationalism that came to the fore in the 2016 election. Um, this book is, is, is an ex excellent analysis of this. Of course, it comes in a, uh, from a, uh, another work that we had talked about here in the Athenaeum two years ago, almost this month. We had Thomas Mann here uh, talking about polarization in 2015. And of course, at the time, he was discussing his book, which he co-authored with uh, Norm, entitled It's Even Worse Than It Looks. And it took a bit of convincing for him on this podium to try to convince us that it was worse than it looks. Well, of course, in the latest uh, version of this book, they've changed the title. Of course, it's now, it's even worse than it was. <clears throat> so um, this has been, you know, the product of, of a long consideration of, of American politics, where the Republican Party is headed, where the Democratic Party is headed, where, where, how citizens should think about politics, how citizens relate to politics. These are all vital questions that, uh, that I, along with the, I'm sure you, are looking forward to hearing from uh, Dr. Ornstein. Um, but just as a few words of introduction, let me also say that, uh, as you know, he's a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. He studies politics, uh, elections, and the U.S. Congress. He's the co-host of AEI's Election Watch series. He's a contributing editor and columnist for the National Journal and the Atlantic. He's a BBC News analyst. Um, he's a longtime observer and analyst of American politics. Uh, you may have seen him on C-SPAN, CBC, uh, CBS, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, NPR, you name it. Uh, he's a leading voice uh, in American politics, and we're really fortunate to have him here today speaking about One Nation After Trump. So please join me in welcoming him to the, to the Athenaeum. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Zach. I'm really delighted to be here. I did want to give you the uh, subtitle of the book, uh, and I actually came up with that uh, and then recruited my two co-authors, uh, which is A Guide for the Perplexed, the Disillusioned, the Desperate, and the Not Yet Deported. Uh, so <laughs> Tom and I did a book in 2006 called The Broken Branch about Congress. And then we did It's Even Worse Than It Looks and updated it to It's Even Worse Than It Was. And I joked for a while that the next uh, book would have to be titled Run for Your Lives. Uh, <laughs> but I actually wasn't going to do another book uh, before this year. Uh, I didn't want to be the Debbie Downer of uh, American politics, but decided that uh, the events of the last year or two uh, really demanded it of me and my co-authors uh, to come up with something. And here we are today, this is uh, day 292 of the Trump presidency, or as he says, longer than any other president. <laughs> and my expectation, and I dampened down the fears of many people that I knew uh, before the election, uh, not to worry because if Trump gets elected, he won't be with us long, 
he'll leave us for a younger country. Uh, <laughs> but so far, that hasn't happened, and in the end, he may leave us for an older country, uh, the way uh, things have been going. Uh, but what I'd like to do is uh, talk a bit about uh, the, uh, the arc of the book is actually uh, 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 th three sections that are not entirely separate but with uh, themes. The first is how we got here, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the second is what are the dangers that we now face in our political system and the challenges that we have to deal with. And the third is uh, at least a bit of a roadmap for where we can go from here. And in the end, uh, more than I thought when I first started, it's a hopeful book. Uh, hopeful that um, fundamentally we may have been jolted uh, into a realization of some of the larger dangers we face in the society. And we're now seeing a lot of elements of civil society and other actors in the process uh, stepping forward uh, to take on those challenges that maybe our culture is strong enough to overcome this. So let me start with a little bit on how we got here. And the fundamental there is to understand that Donald Trump didn't just emerge from nowhere or emerge from the swamp on his own. The seeds of Trumpism have been set for a very long time, and not just in our politics. You can go back 40 years or more to the signs of a decline in community and a beginning of atomization in our society. Uh, and we note, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, the seminal book by Bob Putnam, Bowling Alone, uh, but also many other sociologists around that time from across the political spectrum were writing about how some of the fundamental bonds of society were disappearing as we cope with both modern society and communications and transportation uh, and with some of the great economic challenges that we face. And we saw it again with a very interesting book by the sociologist Kai Erickson uh, about a town in West Virginia that had thrived and really had all of the things you'd want in a community, kind of a model where uh, neighbors and friends and everybody joined together to make that community work and then they had a terrible flood. And after that, everything kind of fell apart and the community disappeared. And we could see some of these stresses and strains emerging in our society for a significant period of time. And they have been exacerbated and worsened along the way by not just the growing inequality, uh, economic inequality that we have seen that now leave us uh, basically um, in a situation that is comparable to or even worse than what existed in Juan Perón's Argentina, and neither party, frankly, has done much to address that set of issues, and that became dramatically exacerbated with the financial collapse uh, and the economic crisis in 2008. But what we have also seen emerging uh, in a modern and global economy, as some parts of the country have thrived, in particular within the metropolitan areas, and other parts of the country, as you move away from them, have stagnated and face even greater economic challenges. And the economic challenges bring with them tremendous social challenges as well. So there's that, and then there's the nature of our politics. And here we come back to some themes that are fairly familiar ones for me in both my own experience in Washington over now uh, close to uh, closing in on 50 years, and what I've written about for a long time. And uh, we point a finger pretty squarely at Newt Gingrich. <coughs> I met Newt when he first came to Congress uh, in January of 1979. He had been, of course, a, uh, a history professor at a small college in Georgia. He'd run twice before for Congress unsuccessfully and then finally caught that wave in 1978. And I had just moved uh, to a position, an adjunct position, at uh, the American Enterprise Institute, as my friend Tom Mann had. And one of the first projects that we had pitched in going there was to have a series of small, off-the-record dinners with members of the class of 1978. 
kind of take it through their first two years in office and see their perceptions of their own institution. And we looked at the members and I uh, tried to pick a small cross-section of eight who would, we thought, had a chance of making uh, some mark uh, in the institution while also covering all the other uh, bases. And uh, it was quite a class and we chose pretty well. Newt was there, as was uh, another of his freshman uh, colleagues, Dick Cheney, and another, Geraldine Ferraro, who of course went on to be the first woman to be on a presidential uh, ticket, uh, and others. Uh, and what was interesting is how much Newt dominated the conversations. We were then at that point 24 years into uh, Democratic uh, Party hegemony in the House of Representatives that ultimately reached 40 years, and Newt's goal, driving goal, was to create a Republican majority and he had a thesis, and he had a strategy, and he had the tactics to go along with it from the day he entered Congress, and it really was, we're never gonna get him into a majority if we keep going down this cycle where no matter what's happening in the nation, the individual members of Congress find clever ways of separating themselves out and saying, they're the problem, not me, and the members, especially in the majority, have money and they get more money because they're in the majority and they have the name recognition and what we have to do is to create an atmosphere where people are so disgusted with Washington and Congress that they'll say, throw them all out and they'll throw the ins out and bring the outs in and then we'll get a majority. And it took him 16 years. But along the way, he worked and managed to radicalize his own party, including many members who had grown comfortable being in the minority but actually working pretty closely with the members of the majority because most of the members were somewhere near the middle and the moderately conservative Republicans could work with the moderately conservative, mainly Southern Democrats who chaired the committees and they were fine, although they were in a subordinate position. And he went after the majority and created a tribal atmosphere, which is what he wanted. He wanted to pit the one side against the other. He used the ethics process as a weapon uh, and basically criminalized policy differences and finally found the right opportunity two years into the Clinton administration and won this sweeping victory and became the Speaker of the House. Now I can tell you that Newt didn't believe most of that stuff. He saw it as a way of gaining power and then once he could become the Speaker, he would re-empower Congress. They would overwhelm the presidency. He'd be like the alternative president and obviously that did not work out for him. But along the way, as he recruited members to come in who really did believe that it was all evil and awful, and created even more broadly in the country this sense of tribalized politics that the other side is the enemy, not just the adversary, it's had implications that have reverberated for a long time. It wasn't just Newt. Now, in 1987, the Federal Communications Commission repealed the so-called Fairness Doctrine, which said that on broadcasts, uh, radio or television, if you have one point of view represented, you had to be fair and balance it with the other side. And this was long before the modern era of uh, all of the multiple arms of communication that we have, but the FCC did away with it. And at the time, Rush Limbaugh was a noontime radio talk show host in Sacramento. And when that happened, he saw an opportunity. And he moved to New York to try and create a national network. And then the next year, we had another really important event that changed our politics in some ways. And it was when a commission that we had set up every four years called the Quadrennial Commission, consisting of the elites in the society, university presidents, CEOs of corporations, heads of other major institutions uh, who made a recommendation about what to do with the pay of members of Congress, judges, and top executive officials. And they decided uh, in 1987 into 1988 that because there hadn't been a pay raise of any sort for a decade, and it was becoming a real challenge to get people willing to, be, to take judgeships, lifetime appointments with a rate of pay much lower than they could get in law firms or other places, that members of Congress having two residences were having stresses, they would make up for a decade of inflation and, provide, and recommend a 25% pay raise. 
Ronald Reagan endorsed it as he left office and turned it over to his successor, George Herbert Walker Bush, who endorsed it, and all the leaders in Congress endorsed it, and the public went to DEFCON 1. Outrage, and the common reaction was, all right, they're making $87,500 a year, and they say it's getting tough to get by. I'm making 25,000 and if I'm lucky, I get a 1% cost of living adjustment COLA every year. And they're getting 25%. And for Rush Limbaugh, this was the rocket fuel that got him up there into the pantheon of major figures in the society. And his national radio show became a huge success, making him many, many millions of dollars and it created political talk radio. And all of that, including that populist outrage, played into Newt's hands and changed our politics, also creating a competition in Congress where every election the majority could shift hands and the stakes became higher and higher as we moved our parties further apart. And of course, the polarization occurring in our parties was a significant part of this as well. And then we move along as you go through uh, and as the tribalism got worse and uh, as we saw many of the people who Newt had recruited into the House of Representatives move to the Senate and change the culture in the Senate as well, we saw even more of that sense of tribalism. This one little story uh, that I told for some time and then I had to check it out with one of the principals to make sure it wasn't apocryphal. Uh, and that principal was Alan Simpson a longtime Republican senator and a leader in the Senate who retired some years ago and then came back to the Senate for a visit. And as he walked into the chamber, he was joined by one of those Gingrich senators, Rick Santorum. And when he went, walked into the chamber, he spied across the chamber Dale Bumpers, the Democrat from Arkansas, and he went over and gave him a warm embrace and they were chatting very nicely when he noticed an agitated Santorum standing by the door and motioning him back and Simpson went back and he said, yeah, what? And Santorum said, what's that all about? And Simpson said, well, that's Dale Bumpers. He's, uh, we came in in the same class. We're almost like blood brothers. We're extremely close. We work together on many things. And Santorum said to him, we don't do things like that around here anymore. And that was a real symbol. So I asked Simpson if that was accurate, and he said it was. And then I said, was he agitated because you were embracing a Democrat or because you were embracing a guy? And <laughs> in a very earthy way, he suggested it could have been both. Uh, <laughs> but that tells you something about the dynamics of our politics. And then as you move to the Obama years, you find another set of characteristics that helped to shape a climate where we could have a Donald Trump winning a Republican nomination. And uh, of course, it started before Obama became president. And it started really with uh, the financial collapse and the bailout known as TARP, the Troubled Assets Relief Program. And if you recall, uh, President George W. Bush, his Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, the chairman of the Fed who had been appointed by Bush, Ben Bernanke, all went to the leaders of both parties and both houses of Congress and said, we are on the verge of a uh, crisis in the global economy that could make the Great Depression look mild by comparison. We're facing a global credit uh, freeze and we've got to act now. And what we have to do is make sure that the entire financial system doesn't careen completely out of control. And they came up with TARP and it went in front of Congress and it was endorsed by the two presidential candidates as well as every major figure in the financial world, the former chairs of the Fed and the leaders of both parties. And it failed in the House of Representatives because House Republicans, populist at the time said, why should we believe you? Then the Dow dropped over 700 points, which was a big deal at the time. And they came back and they passed it. And what we got was an enormous DEFCON 1 public reaction as well. And the public reaction was, oh, let's get this straight. You have bailed out the miscreants who got us into this mess and let them walk away with big bonuses. And what happened to us? We lost our houses or our houses declined in value by 30 or 40 percent. Now, for most Americans, there are no cash savings. 
Their savings were wrapped up in their homes. And they either disappeared, and this is what they had for their retirement, where they could downsize and have the proceeds to live on, or they could give their kids the college tuition, which I know is very moderate and reasonable at places like uh, Claremont McKenna, <laughs> but at other places it's pretty high. And, uh, or to give them a down payment for a house. And I will give you one figure that is absolutely chilling, and I've just gotten it updated and it's even worse. We do a survey, we see surveys every year asking people, um, if you had an emergency that required uh, that you come up with, now it's $400 in cash, could you do that? Right now, 68% of Americans say they could not come up with $400 in cash if, let's say, you blow a rod on the car, or there's a storm and a tree hits the roof and you gotta pay uh, the deductible on your home insurance, or you have a medical emergency. So imagine the devastation if you at least have a home and all of a sudden it's not what it was. And then imagine people saying, okay, we lost our jobs. Or if we didn't lose our jobs, our employers know we're stuck in this stagnant economy and so they can make us work longer hours for less pay. And what we saw, of course, was the emergence of the Tea Party movement on the right and the Occupy movement on the left. Now, there are differences, and there are different cultures in the parties. The Tea Party movement really was a grassroots movement, but from the grassroots, they organized, and they recruited candidates, and they got a political organization in place to try and have an impact on the politics and the policy. And the Occupy movement occupied, and they set up tent cities across from Wall Street and across from the Federal Reserve and across from the White House, and they occupied for a couple of months. And then it got really gamey. Uh, and uh, the smell overpowered them, and they disbanded and left. Uh, but that movement on the right remained. And then Barack Obama got elected president. And what we saw was the Republicans in Congress, in the House side, they called themselves the young guns, the leaders. And that was Paul Ryan, Kevin McCarthy, and Eric Cantor did a book. And then they went out and fanned out around the country to recruit candidates for office and to get people inflamed enough that they could recapture the House of Representatives, having been devastated in those 2008 elections, by telling them, if we take back the Congress, we will force Barack Obama to his knees, and we will repeal Obamacare, and we'll repeal Dodd-Frank, and we will blow up government as we know it. And they got that support, and they won this smashing victory, and then none of it happened. And then they went out and said, well, look, don't worry because we have unmasked the Kenyan socialist and the scales have been uh, fallen from the eyes of the American people. He'll be a one-term president and then we'll recapture the White House and then we can do all of those things. And it didn't happen. And then they said, you know what? We're outnumbered two to one. They've got the Senate, they've got the White House. It's like if you're a wrestling tag team and they've got two and we've got one, give us two and we can repeal Obamacare and force him to his knees and blow up government as we know it and they won the Senate and none of it happened. And an awful lot of angry people out there became more angry at everybody in Washington, including their own establishment and their own leaders. And that set the seeds for a nomination contest last year with 17 candidates, and most of the people in my profession and our profession, the political science community, believed that it wouldn't matter because we'd had a book, a very influential one called The Party Decides, that said, in the end, the elites decide on who the nominee is, and it'll be the establishment figure, even if they flirt with an outsider for a while. And I wrote a piece saying, no, that's not happening this time. And they said, look, it's in the end, they're gonna go with the obvious establishment figure, Jeb Bush, we'd had Bush 41, and then we had Bush 43, and the motto in the family, no child left behind. <laughs> and of course, early on, Bush did just what you're supposed to do, shock and awe. He got all of the major establishment political consultants working for him. He went out to the donors and basically said, this train is leaving the station. If you don't join with me now, you're frozen out. 
And that worked before, but it didn't work this time. And the fact is, it was going to be an outsider. Now, it didn't have to be Donald Trump. You could easily have imagined it being Ted Cruz. You had the outsider's outsider. Cruz was the insider's outsider whose calling card was going on the Senate floor unprecedented and calling his own leader, Mitch McConnell, a liar right there on the floor. Or it could have been a Carly Fiorina, a CEO, a conservative, a woman. It could have been a Ben Carson, celebrated neurosurgeon, a conservative African-American. But Donald Trump, who started out as a curiosity, talk show barker, you know, celebrity because of all of that, one of many. But Trump understood a couple of things. The first thing he understood was the zeitgeist in the country, in part because of the economic dislocation that we had seen, and the kind of thing that happens when populism emerges as we get nativism, protectionism, and some degree of isolationism emerging, was you hit on those elements. And that's the America first. It is the blow up all the trade deals that have been made by these elites that have screwed you all over. And it is a nativism in which he got to the right of every other candidate on immigration and other related issues. And if you watched any of those debates, it was really kind of stunning to see Ted Cruz disoriented that anybody could get to the right of him on anything. But Trump did that, and it's when he started talking about the Mexican rapists coming over the border and preying on our citizens, and we're going to build the wall and make Mexico pay for it, and we're going to keep the Muslims out of the country, that he moved from one of a group to a, a front-runner position. Now, the second thing that he understood was the anger in a Republican Party and activist base over their own leaders having basically caved and not done what they promised they would do. So when Donald Trump began to talk about his own rivals in terms that were ridiculing them, when he referred to little Marco uh, or weak Jeb, when he took on Fox News, Megyn Kelly at the time, it was, I'm not taking crap from anybody. I'm the kind of guy who, whoops, okay, let me get rid of this. Little counting crows there, for your uh, edification. Uh, uh, that he was actually tapping into that great distrust that people had. And he was also playing on a meme that has been around in American politics for some time, not just with conservatives, which is why can't we run government like a business? And here was a guy who was a businessman. And here was a guy who had purportedly made billions, and it was also what I did for myself, I can do for you. And he also was very clever in playing on the cynicism that people have by saying, I've been a part of the system. I bought and paid for these politicians. I know how it works, and I'll change all of that. And it was a powerful, gut-level set of appeals that put him in place. And little did we know that we would see this experiment work, and we are having government run like a business, but that business is Trump University. So that set the stage for Trump, and I'm not going to go into any of the details that are now so familiar about how he could have, despite all of his flaws and difficulties and weaknesses and somewhat limited base, still won an election. But it's simply important to realize that many of the elements, cultural and otherwise, that led to a Trump brought all of that forward and were in existence and created that climate. And if it weren't Trump now, we would have had somebody like that, or at least somebody with many of the characteristics uh, a little bit further down the road. Now, let me just talk for a few minutes about the dangers that we have now, because this is unlike anything we have seen, not just in our lifetimes, but I think you could argue, uh, unlike uh, most other periods of American history, although there are parallels that we can deal with a little bit too. And here I just want to mention three words that are important and then elaborate on them just a touch. Autocracy, kleptocracy, cacistocracy. Now the first two words are familiar. 
autocracy. Now we have an awful lot written about it, and what's important to realize here is that autocracy doesn't happen overnight in a country that's had a thriving democracy. It happens little by little and step by step, and sometimes it's a familiar analogy and sometimes overused, but the old uh, story of the frog and the uh, pot of cold water turned up degree by degree, and only when it's too late does he realize that uh, it's gonna boil and that'll be the end. And uh, we've had a, a book called On Tyranny. We've had many books. And if you look at even the most chilling thing to me is if you go to the Holocaust Museum, there's a display of the 12 signs that you're heading towards uh, fascism. And you look through that list and it's, you get things like uh, attack the press as the enemy of the people. Attra attack the judiciary uh, as being against you. Uh, talk about your own hegemony. Uh, and you go down through that list and it's a little chilling. Now, kleptocracy, uh, the American political system and our framers set it up with the great fear that we might have uh, somebody who uh, would take advantage of the system for his own benefit or could be influenced by outsiders, foreigners and others, to uh, emoluments clauses in the Constitution. And the expectation was that there be checks and balances in, in the system to guard against a movement towards an autocratic president, but also against a kleptocratic political system. And none of those things are working right now. We have never seen anything like this. The enrichment of a president and his family leveraging the White House for those purposes, but also the unhealthy interactions with other countries. The embrace yesterday of Duterte, who is a mass murderer with many, many hundreds of millions of dollars in investments by the Trump family enterprises in the Philippines, just one part of it doubling the initiation fee at Mar-a-Lago, uh, advertising that if you uh, hold a wedding at Bedminster or Mar-a-Lago, there's a pretty good chance the president will come by and do a photo op with you. All of those things. And now extending to others in his own administration, uh, a very bad element. Now, the term cacistocracy is one less familiar to people. And it's one that is a 17th century term that fell into disuse. Uh, that's now back. It comes from a Greek word and it means government by the least uh, and most unscrupulous among us. And it can be extended to the worst kind of government. And when you look at some of the people put in place in the administration, including a lot who have had no experience running anything in government, you look at the systematic move now to devastate the uh, diplomatic corps and uh, the people who've had experience in uh, uh, using diplomacy and development uh, that uh, won't be coming back for decades. You look at the fact that we have not even had nominations to fill ambassadorships in critical places like South Korea, for example. Uh, the fact that of the 602 Senate confirmable executive positions that make significant policy in an administration Fewer than half have even been nominated 10 months into the administration. It's not a very good sign of governance moving forward. And all of those are dangers that we have to deal with. And finally, uh, of course, great detail on these things in the book, which, by the way, makes a great holiday gift. Uh, uh, any holiday. You got Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is right around the corner. Many of you will have bar mitzvahs or christenings, lots of things. Uh, so, but let me just talk for a bit about the third part because I think there is some hopefulness here. And whatever your political views, uh, the election results last Tuesday show a higher level of public interest and a mobilization. And I believe that what we're seeing here is a jolt where you could use an, almost an analogy that Donald Trump may be the Dunkirk of American politics. If any of you saw the marvelous Christopher Nolan film uh, about something that a lot of people had forgotten in terms of uh, history. And of course, what happened was the British Army, almost the entire British Army, and their French allies had been beaten into submission by the Germans, 
had retreated to the beach at Dunkirk. They were sitting ducks there. <coughs> the response of the British military, inadequate, tepid, and British civil society awoke to the danger that it, this could be an existential threat, and they mobilized and saved the day. Donald Trump, you could say, has jolted us in two ways. The first is the larger dangers to the society that long preceded him. The fact that we are increasingly divided and tribal in our politics, but also in other ways. That we are moving to blue states and red states, which means that the political system built around an electoral college and a Senate and a House isn't going to work necessarily if you don't have a kind of competition. But also within the blue states and the red states, the enormous divide as you go from the major metropolitan areas to cities of, say, 250,000, down to communities of 50,000, to the rural areas, were increasingly set apart in our economic circumstances, in our education, in the challenges we face in our society, in our global views. And that if it weren't for a Trump now, we might have slid, just like that frog, to a point of no return in terms of the division in the society. And those secular differences that we've seen in so many other societies pull them apart, that we're seeing in Spain now, that we saw in the former Yugoslavia, could have reached a really serious boiling point here. And now I think we're jolted into a different uh, realization. And a part of the book is an appeal to an empathy, one of our toughest tasks is to separate out the evil people out there, and there are evil people. There are rank racists, there are anti-Semites, there are people who are stoking the worst elements of the society, but separate them out from a lot of other people who may have voted to empower some of those, but who have enormous challenges in their own lives, who have reasons for believing that their futures are not particularly great and neither are the futures for their children. And now, creating a different kind of a dialogue and reaching some level of empathy, we're starting to see forces in the society emerge to help to do that. And at the same time, looking at ways in which we might repair the structures in our political system so that we can move away from what is a genuine crisis in legitimacy. Among other things, if you look at the Electoral College, in the you know, popular vote really began to matter a little bit first in 1824. And you look at the 44 elections from 1824 through 1996. And you could make a case that only one of those was it very clear that the winner uh, of the presidency had lost the popular vote. A couple of others that had more ambiguities involved. One out of 44. Since then, two out of five. And we're going to see more of those in the future. And the first time. Many of you don't remember as well, uh, because you were young, uh, after the 2000 election and the great dispute that occurred, most Americans said, you know, even if we didn't like the outcome, that's the set of rules, and it's like a tennis match. It's not the number of games you win. It's the number of sets. But by the second time, you're beginning to think that there's something wrong. And if this happens more and more, you lose that sense of legitimacy that the people have not spoken. And we have an enormous challenge as well in the House and in the Senate that I won't get into as much, but starting to think about ways in which we can repair this system. Now we're seeing an increased impetus to do so. And dealing with the yawning economic inequality and the enormous challenges that we're going to face ahead as technology changes. I came out here today from Los Angeles in an Uber, and I talked to the Uber and Lyft drivers that I use on a regular basis. And for most of them, you know, they've managed to become entrepreneurs on their own and they can adjust to fit the lifestyles that they have. You get a lot of single parents. You get a lot of people between jobs or people who are doing this to make a little extra money while they're doing their jobs. But I also rode last week in a Tesla that is one of the models for the self-driving cars. And the fact is most of those Uber drivers are going to be replaced in five or eight years. The fact is that all of those factory jobs that have been promised to return are not going to Mexico as much as they're going to robots. And that we're now seeing a new generation of artificial intelligence where the artificial intelligence 
uh, uh, machines are going to be able to create machines that are even more sophisticated and that will take away more jobs. We've got enormous challenges there and we've got to start thinking about ways of creating, among other things, a tax system that incentivizes job creation instead of just saying, just give those companies more money and of course the jobs will be there when every bit of history we have, including in Kansas as the experiment, tells us that it doesn't work that way. But we're now starting to see at least a movement to look at the working class as a working class, not a white working class. But the fact is, the challenges that the black working class had decades ago, pointed out by the sociologist William Julius Wilson, we're now seeing. And if we can create something that moves beyond pitting one group's pain against another, we've got a chance to do something about it. And as we see lawyers, Conservative intellectuals disturbed about what's happened in the party they've called their home. Religious communities, civic activist groups emerging from the grassroots. We're seeing an emergence in civil society of an understanding of the different kinds of threats we face, including with the president that we have now, uh, whose overseas ventures this week underscore the larger depth of the challenges that we have. How we prevail out of all of this remains to be seen. Whether Donald Trump fills the remainder of his presidency uh, in four years, or whether we have a constitutional uh, and institutional challenge in the weeks and months and years ahead, what happens in our two politics, and what happens to a Democratic Party that's going to face its own internal strains, and we're already seeing them played out uh, on a public stage. Uh, all of that is unclear, uh, but we can all look to ways in which we can recapture uh, a democracy that has never been perfect, that has always had some of these very, very difficult strains, but has also managed to keep it within a set of boundaries that's enabled us to survive much longer than other countries have. To imagine that we are always immune from those challenges now uh, would be naive, and to realize now that we face what I would see as an existential threat to us, and seeing so many people respond in a heartening way is uh, a very positive thing. And with that, uh, let me stop, and uh, maybe we can take at least a few uh, questions or comments, and there are roving microphones. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting talk. Um, <laughs> a voice from on high. Yes. <laughs> I want to question a little bit about the issue of inequality, and I think you um, uh, dismissed the Occupy movement a little bit. Uh, too casually, I think the conversation changed after uh, Occupy. No one was talking about inequality, or very few people were talking yeah. about inequality beforehand, and it became the the meme, the one percent, became an organizing uh, uh, idea uh, about what our fundamental problems were. So it seems to me that both on the left and the right, it's this question of unfairness, of inequality. Um, what? Is there anything that you can imagine that Democrats and Republicans could get together to focus on um, uh, uh, addressing this, this problem that I think is driving both the left and the right to distraction? It's certainly, and you know, uh, it, it absolutely is the case that what we saw the potency of the Occupy movement in a sense with the Sanders candidacy and the uh, uh, robustness of that candidacy which itself was in some ways kind of odd because you had um, a guy who'd never been a Democrat for a day in his life and only made it clear he only joined uh, the party for uh, his own 
immediate purposes and then left it after he left uh, his candidacy, but still got this level of support. And it was because of that uh, sense on the populist left, which has many parallels with the populist right. And the fact is we have a chapter in the book about Trump as a phony populist. And you see with this tax bill now that uh, it's, uh, it's true that, as Trump says, he's going to do a tax bill uh, so easy that anybody can understand it. And then he said, and that means even I can understand it. But he called Democratic senators the other day and said, uh, this is going to really hit the rich just like me. We're going to face this terrible uh, uh, tax increases so that we can give to uh, working class people. And of course, that's simply not a reality. Um, but plenty of people on the populist right, and many who voted for him, did it for just the reason that he was going to help them out and take them out of their economic stagnation and misery. And the fact is, some of my colleagues uh, at the American Enterprise Institute, conservative policy intellectuals, have uh, come up with some ideas uh, for uh, creating jobs and creating better paying jobs that uh, are met with a great deal of interest from uh, the people on the left. Uh, that includes a family leave policy that's gotten broad support. It includes uh, job sharing, tax credit kinds of things. Uh, but there isn't much interest inside the political arena. Now, I'll just mention one thing that's important to keep in mind. When people ask for analogies with the current moment, you know, the obvious one, which is the troubling one, is the period right before the Civil War. But I would argue that uh, it's Reconstruction. And if you remember what happened in the aftermath of the Civil War, you had freed African uh, slaves, freed American slaves, black slaves, and white sharecroppers who all had these terrible economic problems and a tiny group of elites who were making a fortune off of them. And there was an opportunity there for dramatic change, and the elites realized that they could use race as the wedge. And that set in motion um, things that have reverberated to the present day. And we're seeing some of that emerge now. And it's why you could find places on the left and the right that focus on, as I suggested, working class, not white working class or others and find policies that would fulfill the social contract, which is if you say, I'm going to work, and I'll go to work, and I'll be there every day, and I'm going to work hard, and what you get in return is a roof over your head and that of your family, food to put on the table for them, the ability to educate them and to have some health care, you can find policies that will move us more in that direction that are not left policies or right policies, that are smart policies. But moving out of the tribal environment to make any of that happen, and especially given that people who are going to be open to that are the ones who are most prone to retire now, um, that's a real challenge. Yeah. Hi. Uh, you mentioned TARP and the sort of populist resentment of, of Wall Street. Um, now we see in the Republican uh, tax proposal, a proposal to tax the endowments of the wealthiest colleges. Do you think that elite colleges now are kind of subject to the same sort of resentment and what, if anything, do you think yeah. we ought to do about it? So whenever you have a, a populism emerge, and I alluded to this a little bit before, you know, if you go back to that pay raise in the late 1980s and early 1990s, we had populism on the left with Ralph Nader emerge for the 1992 campaign and on the right with Pat Buchanan and then it was Ross Perot in the center. And it was all, it was protectionist and nativist and isolationist, but it was also anti-elite. But that's been magnified dramatically now. And I think there is a, uh, and partly with the partisan tribalism, it's very difficult for anybody to stand up now and get a kind of broad acceptance across the spectrum. Because if you take a position that is in any way challenging the political uh, calculus of one side, they'll label you. And that happened to Warren Buffett, for example, you know, a few years ago when he stood up and said, I think it's bizarre that I have a lower tax rate than my secretary, and the Wall Street Journal went after him hammer and tong. Uh, that's difficult. And I think because of the divide between the educated and the uneducated now, or the less educated, because of the fact that more educated people have managed to navigate through these difficult economic times, 
and it's in those communities where education is lower and where we haven't been able to provide adequate training using apprenticeships or other means to move people into jobs that could be available or transform jobs that have been lost into something different. And also we're dealing with a group of people in many cases at an age and stage in their lives where you can say all you want, we'll retrain you and they're, it's just gonna be foreign to them. Uh, that makes for an enormous challenge and it means that attacks on the educated and attacks on their institutions and especially on the elite institutions will matter and it also means that the temptation to go after them and that includes by taxing their endowments for example or by just uh, going after uh, the uh, professoriate um, become more tempting as well. And there's a great danger in this and of course uh, one of the other elements that we have to keep in mind is we're now seeing that one of the things that's made our uh, elite universities so vibrant is that they're magnets for the best and brightest from around the world. And we're seeing enrollment by foreign students decline now. And that means that we are losing out on bringing in people who enrich our society. Some stay, some go back, but if they go back, they bring with them an appreciation for the United States and the values of the United States, and they bring back a training that makes their own societies work better. And if their own societies work better and their economies work better, that's great for us. It means markets and it means stability and all wonderful things. And the insane immigration policies that we're pursuing and the insane visa policies that we're pursuing and the nativism that we're pursuing is deeply destructive in so many ways beyond just the humanitarian one. It's hitting at our own self-interest. And if we end up degrading those institutions of higher learning that have been always seen as having 40 of the top 50 in the world, where does that leave the country? Uh, and that's part, I think, of the, the challenge we have is not just a political one or even a social one. That's where a cacistocracy comes in, where government by the worst among us makes incalculably stupid decisions that harm the long-term future of the country. Well, I, that's a terrible note to stop on, but... Have a nice day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we've all got to get back to class and back yeah. to work, so please join me in thanking Dr. Ornstein for his discussion.